She only comes out at night, the lean and hungry type. Nothing is new. I've seen her here before. From the depths of his dream, Dakota heard the start of the song. It was one of those oldies that George loved, but Nicky rolled his eyes at. Old school stuff, he called it. Like he didn't have a love affair with the Wu-Tang Clan since the fourth grade. His mother would have a bird if she bothered to listen to some of the stuff that came out of his Walkman, but he was careful to keep the lyrics under his breath. Cody! Dakota rolled over, trying to block out the sun, the birds, and his mother as she called from downstairs. He'd been dreaming of the house at the end of the block again. He'd been dreaming of the Shelby place, and how it had taken his friend on a long-ago summer day, almost four years ago. Dakota hated the dreams, but it was hard to shake at the best of times. As his mother called him again, he tried to keep his mind on the hazy kitchen of that dark house. The door was opening. In any second now, the monster would snatch Chris, and he would be... He groaned as his eyes sprang open. He'd lost the dream. He bemoaned that summer break couldn't have started yesterday as he rolled out of his bed. From the clock radio, Hall and Oates were warning a young man that he better beware, that he better take care, because the woman he'd set his eyes on was bad news. She was a real man-eater. Cody, are you up? Come on, honey, it's the last day of school. You don't want to be late. Pulling on the same jeans he'd worn the day before. They weren't that dirty, after all, and if they couldn't stand up on their own, then they'd keep for another day. He slid on a t-shirt that was the no color of many washes and many wearings, and laced up his high tops as his mother called out again. From downstairs, he could smell the mingling aromas of bacon and eggs, pancakes and butter, and it made his mouth water. I'm almost ready, Ma, he called back, grabbing his bag and descending the stairs. His sister had beaten him to the table, and one look told him that she had decided to eat first and get dressed later. Her hair looked like a bird's nest, and she was still wearing her nightgown with the happy horse on it, something that her other sophomore friends would have rolled with laughter if they'd seen. She looked up from her eggs long enough to stick her tongue out at him, and he returned the greeting as he reached for the ketchup. Gag, she intoned, rolling her eyes as she watched him cover his eggs. Have you had a look in a mirror yet? You got a lot of room to talk, Dakota said. Come on, kids, his mother said, adding pancakes to his plate. Rachel, your bus will be here in five minutes, and you aren't even dressed yet. Cody, she began, but Dakota cut her off. Come on, Ma. Nobody calls me Cody anymore. I've been Dakota for six whole months now. Cody makes me sound like a baby. She kissed his head, ruffling his hair as he tried to wiggle out from under it. Well, you'll always be my baby. The doorbell rang just as he was finishing his pancakes, and Dakota whooped with glee as he got up to let his friends in. Nicky was on the stoop his hair giving him an extra two inches, and George was with him, both grinning as Dakota came out the door. He yelled back inside that he had to get to school and grabbed his bag as his mom stuck her head out to hand him his lunch and ask him if he had everything he needed. I'm all set, Mom, he said, waving his hand as he headed out the door for school. Have a good day. Don't forget the curfew, she shouted. Dakota made a disgusted noise, like anyone could forget the curfew like you could forget the thing that was going to ruin your whole summer vacation. Shake a leg, Nicky said, slapping him five as Dakota came stumbling onto the front porch. It's our last day. We want to get there quick and get out quicker. Dakota grabbed his beat-up Huffy from under the eaves, and the boys set out towards whatever might come. It was the last day of school, and he was hoping to make it fly by so he could get on with his summer. The streets were a bustle with kids heading to school, and they pulled their bikes out amongst them like ships on the bay. They knew every inch of the neighborhood, having played here since their earliest memories, and as they set out for school, the whole world seemed bathed in that pre-summer glow that signaled the return of freedom. Nikki was already making plans for a bottle hunt after school, wanting to recycle the empties so they could go to the movies this weekend, but their plans were paused as they came to a stop in front of a familiar house. It had been a sad, peeling reminder of their missing friend for the last four years now, but it seemed like it had gotten a facelift. The house on the eastern end of the horseshoe had been freshly painted, the scrag grass cut back to a respectable level, and the for sale sign had finally been taken up. There was a moving truck out front, and as they watched, a pair of burly moving men went in and out with various bits of furniture. 
It seemed an odd omen to begin the summer on, and if any of them had believed in portents, it would have given them more than a pause. Looks like somebody finally bought the old McCormick place, George said, breaking their spell as they set off again. Hope they've got some kids, Nikki said. We could use some new blood on the street. Might be nice to not be a trio anymore. Not that I don't appreciate your company, he added with a grin. None of them spared the same reverence for the old Shelby place as they rode by, and for good reason. If Chris's old house had been ill-kept, then the Shelby place was a downright eyesore. It was easily the largest house on the block, and had been a crumbling wreck for as long as any of them could remember. As bad as the overgrown yard and peeling outside were, all three boys knew that the inside was worse than the outside. Dakota still dreamed about the nightmare caverns of that peeling relic sometimes, but the kitchen was always the worst. That sickly, horror movie green tile, the bloated dark wood of the cabinets, the rusted sink that somehow still dripped, and that single bandy-legged table with its solitary chair. The basement door had come creakily open, drawing the four boys' attention as they looked at the gaping maw of that waiting monster. Chris had gone to it, shining his light down as he prepared to descend. They had told him not to, said it was too much, but he had looked back and, grinning, told them not to be such chickens. That's when something had grabbed him, tugging him down into the abyss and out of their lives forever. They'd run like cowards, and when the police had questioned them later, they had all said the same thing. Something had yanked him in, and Chris had been gone. As they rode past, Dakota imagined he could almost see someone looking back at them through the single smeary window that hadn't been covered with wood after someone had broken them out with rocks long before they had ever been born. He turned away from the house, not wanting to know what ghostly apparition might be there. The little neighborhoods that made up the burrows were soon behind them, and as the trees parted, they came out on Culver's main street. The town had its Memorial Day bunting out, and the effect was impressive. Culver tried its best to attract out-of-towners, tourists who might pump a little money into the economy, but ultimately, it was up to the locals to keep the place afloat. Dakota and his friends rode past the drugstore, the movie theater, the little hardware store where the old men were already gathering, and onward to City Hall. They were passing the large notice board when they first saw the girl. She was a stranger to them then, a skinny blonde girl on a fading red 10-speed who was looking at the board with some interest. She looked up as they approached, and Dakota thought for a moment he'd seen a ghost. Her eyes were blue, her blonde hair long and fine as the wind moved it, her smile genuine as she lifted a hand to greet the boys. She was older than Chris had been when he'd been snatched, but they could have still been siblings. Excuse me, I'm looking for the middle school. Do, do any of you guys know where it is? Yeah, Dakota answered. We're on our way there now. Cool. Mind if I follow you? The maps here are kind of useless. Not a bit, Nikki answered for them as he fell into a comical bow over his handlebars. Allow us to introduce ourselves. That's George and Dakota, and I'm Nikki. Crystal, she said, we just moved here from San Diego. She fell in with their convoy with the comfortable ease that would have surprised an adult, but seemed as easy as breathing to children. They chatted a little as they rode in a small cluster of students, all making their way to one of the three schools that gave Schoolyard Road its name. The elementary school came first, looking like a saltine box lying on its side. Then the middle school, which looked like a kid's sandcastle, except made of bricks. Beyond it was the high school, but none of them would discover its mysteries for another two years, if they were lucky. As they slid their bikes into the rack in front of the slightly lumpy brick edifice, Dakota voiced the question they'd all been wondering. Are you really starting today? He said, sounding apologetic. It's... It's the last day of school before summer. Oh no, I, I won't be starting till next year. My mom got a call from the principal yesterday and she sent me with some forms for the office. I guess they need authorization to get my records from my old school. 
As the four walked through the door, they saw a small board by the office that held the same sort of foreboding as the one in front of City Hall. It held the posters of the two kids who'd gone missing in April, as well as the faded reminders of those who had gone before them. Crystal stopped to look at them, and Dakota suddenly wondered if it had really been the map that had drawn her attention earlier. Spooky stuff, Nikki said, leaning in to half whisper into her ear. Madeline was a little girl, but Jasper was older than us. It's crazy to think that he could have been snatched like that. Snatched? Crystal asked. Well, sure, George piped up. That's what they call it when kids go missing in Culver. How long has it been going on? Crystal asked, sounding a little afraid as she glanced at the older notices. It officially started a few years ago, George said, moving up to stand next to her. It's usually between two or three kids a year, but most of them are just chalked up to runaways. That's what they're calling Jasper, though his dad claims he never would. It's a little harder with Madeline, since six-year-olds don't usually run away on their way to Girl Scouts. Do they think it's the same person doing the snatchings? Crystal asked. It's been floated, Dakota said, but no one seems to know. There's no pattern, nothing connecting it. It all just started happening about four years ago. Jeez, guys, Nikki said, trying for sarcasm but landing on put out. Great way to welcome a new face. I'm sure now she'll want to stay forever. That's, that's okay, Crystal assured him. My dad and I are into that kind of thing. Spooky stuff doesn't really bother me. The bell rang then, and Crystal thanked them for helping her. Maybe you'd like to hang out with us after school, Nikki said, hopefully. We're trying to get some money together so we can see a movie on Saturday. Sounds like fun, Crystal said. And as the boys split off to go to class, Dakota hoped she would come hang out with them. He couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt like she might be the fourth they'd been looking for to round out their group. A group that had felt incomplete since Chris had gone missing. When she met them outside the school later, the mood was drastically different. This is so unfair, Nicky said, throwing his hands up as he walked to the bike rack. They're just being cautious, Nick, George said, trying to calm him down. It isn't enough that this curfew means we have to be in before dark, but now all the businesses have to close an hour before sunset, too? None of the good movies even started before six. All we'll be able to see is baby movies on the daytime matinee. Oh, uh, last time I checked, The Black Cauldron wasn't a baby movie, George put in. Grow up, Georgie, Nikki flashed at him. I wanted to see something with some teeth, not something rated PG. What's wrong? Crystal asked mounting up to ride with them as they explained what had happened today. The last day of school was usually something reserved for yearbook signings and pizza parties and end-of-the-year relaxation. Today had been mostly taken up by an assembly with Sheriff Millwood. He had recently had the job dropped in his lap by the former Sheriff Gabriel Hurd, and he was trying his best to get this kidnapper so the town didn't hang him from one of the lampposts some night. As such, he had taught a three-hour assembly on stranger danger and summer safety, and told all the kids about the curfew and the limited shopping hours and how it was all to keep them safe. It's to keep his job safe, you mean, Nikki said. My dad said that if one more kid goes missing, the Elks Club's about ready to pull their backing and maybe even cut his brake lines. That's awful, Crystal said. The main street looked more like a ghost town now and they could see the flyers for the new hours of operation in every window they passed. Oh, he's not serious. They'd never really cut his brake lines. No, not that. I mean, the kids are going missing, and they don't seem like they have any idea why. Dakota shrugged. It's just something that keeps happening. It's why we stay in a group. The kids that get taken are usually by themselves. It's still a little odd, Crystal said. I rode around some today while you guys were in school, and it seems like no one has any clue what's going on. They're afraid, but they can't say as they've seen anyone, or any weirdos in vans, or anyone suspicious. Most of them seem to have just chalked it up as something that happens. Yeah, that's a real pain, Dakota said, unknowingly mirroring his elders, but really just wanting to change the subject. So, did we still want to get bottles for movie money? We can go ahead to the dump and... What if what if we did something? Crystal said, making it sound like a sudden idea, but clearly it was something she'd been considering. Like what? Nikki asked. 
What if... What if we kind of looked around, Crystal said. You know, kind of helped out and tried to find the culprit. All three boys looked at her like she'd lost her mind. You, you want us to try to find the guy who's snatching kids? Dakota asked, not sure he had heard her right. I mean, if the police can't find him, what chance do we have? Nikki pointed out. Oh, I don't know, George said. The police have overlooked a lot of key evidence here. I've been telling you guys for a while now that this didn't actually start with the kids. It really started about six years ago with... George, I swear to God, if you trot that missing pet crap out again, I'll snatch you myself, Nikki said. But it makes sense. After all, we were looking for missing pets when Chris got... But Dakota gave him a look, and he clammed up. They didn't talk about Chris any more than they had to, and certainly not around people who weren't in the know. Dakota liked Crystal, but she wasn't there yet, and might never be. Come on, guys, Crystal said. Sounds like you've already thought about it. What did you really have to do anyway this summer, besides goof around? George was already sold, and Dakota could see Nikki beginning to flip-flop. He couldn't say it surprised him. If a pretty girl told him to catch the culprit all by himself for a chance at a date, he'd probably try. Nikki was a soft touch when it came to girls, and Dakota could tell he was about to be outvoted. I, I guess we could try, Nikki hedged. I mean, what were we really doing anyway? Plus, Crystal added, just to sweeten the pot, imagine the reward money if we pull it off. You'd probably have no need of bottle picking to get movie money. Oh, heck yeah, Nikki added, lifting his bike tire in a magnificent two-second wheelie before almost falling off as he dropped it back down. I'm in. She had grasped both Nikki's great loves, money and girls. There was no chance of salvaging it now, and Dakota knew it. He sighed. Fine, but promise me that when we don't find anything in about a week, we'll give this up and move on. Agreed. Sure, sure, Crystal said, smiling brightly. Let's, let's meet in my garage this afternoon. With any luck, we can wrap this up before school starts and get everything back to normal. Sure, Dakota said. Piece of cake, right? They had all made a quick trip home so they could drop off their book bags before meeting back at Crystal's garage. To no one's surprise, her family were the new owners of the McCormick place. The garage had once been home to Mr. McCormick's tools and car parts and things he used to tune up his roadster, but now it looked rather sad and empty. Dakota was sure that Crystal's family would soon fill it up with junk of their own, but until then, it was just a ratty couch, a fridge full of off-brand pop, and a whiteboard she had hung on the wall. The radio on the corner of the table was playing something low but familiar, and Dakota felt a twinge run up his spine as he recognized it. He tried to block it out. Seems the song was popular this week, and the lyrics were becoming a little ominous. Oh, oh, here she comes. Watch out, boy, she'll chew you up. There was a little table in front of the couch, Something small for cards or projects that could be easily folded up again. And here was George with his notes spread out. Oh, oh, here she comes. She's a man-eater. Dakota reached out and turned it off before sitting back as he and Nikki lounged unenthusiastically on the couch. George was preparing to discuss his favorite topic of the last two years, the ongoing Snatcher case. And Dakota and Nikki were preparing to suffer through another round of Detective George and his constant theories. This might well be new to Crystal, but the two boys had heard it until their ears were like to bleed. George had been compiling evidence since the fifth grade, probably since before then even. George was of the opinion that this had all started when they were seven with the pet disappearances that had plagued the neighborhood. He found it interesting that no one had ever put the two crimes together, but what was really interesting was how George kept yapping when no one else cared. Who went from snatching cats and dogs to snatching kids anyway? like Sheriff Hurd had told him when he'd tried to bring it up during last year's Policeman's Day Assembly. That's not really how it works, kid. It all started about five years ago, with the disappearance of Mrs. Maxine's Yorkie, Princess. Princess had been led into the backyard to do her business, as Miss Maxine stated, just after sunset. Miss Maxine went back to open the door 20 minutes later, as Gunsmoke wrapped up on the TV, to discover that Princess was nowhere to be found. 
Riveting, Nikki said, but Crystal shushed him. A week later, Mrs. Bosco put up signs for her missing Shih Tzu. Kazoon tight, Nikki said, drawing a chuckle from Dakota and a sour look from Crystal. Lucky, George said, powering through, who went missing off her back porch. She said they usually put them out at night, but when they went to let them in the next morning, they were gone. He looked at the three of them like a lawyer in a court show, but Dakota just shrugged at him. So? There were about 25 missing pet reports in those two years. The Humane Society reported a dip in strays over the past three years of 50% too. Pets still go missing sometimes to this day. It's not just small dogs or cats anymore. Remember when Mr. Grouse had posters up for Hank last year? Hank was a pretty big dog, easily about 50 or 60 pounds. That's a lot of dog to just snatch out of somebody's yard. Okay, okay, but what's this got to do with missing kids? Nikki said. George pushed out an exasperated breath as he pushed his glasses up his nose. All the pets were reported missing in the surrounding neighborhoods as well, the same place the kids are getting snatched. It's not a coincidence, it's a pattern. You guys go to the same junior officers meeting I do every Thursday. Don't you learn anything? He was referring to the club hosted by the Culliver Police Force to hopefully bolster recruitment in the coming years for their dwindling law enforcement office. Dakota, whose stepfather was one of those officers, had insisted that he give it a try, but George went all on his own. Nicky went because he didn't want to hang out by himself on Thursdays, and Dakota had to admit that the meetings were sometimes entertaining. I learned how black lights work and how to take fingerprints, Nicky put in. I learned that I can shoot a pellet gun pretty good, which may or may not affect my score on the range if and when I choose to join the police force, Dakota added. George closed his eyes and shook his head clearly as done with them as they were with him. Well, I learned what a pattern in criminal behavior is, which is what this clearly is. He was practicing, honing his skills so that when he escalates to children, he'd have it down pat. There probably isn't a lot of difference between snatching kids and snatching your average house pet. You gain their trust, you offer them something they want, you act friendly, get their guard down, and then you strike before they expect it. That's what he's doing. Dakota had to admit he was making sense. If you were going to abduct kids, then it made sense to learn the neighborhood, study the habits of the residents, and get a feel for the routines. George had clearly picked up more at these meetings than he had. Maybe he really had been onto something all this time. Look at this, George said, taking a map out of the folder he'd been keeping his evidence in. It's a map of all the missing pets that got reported. Of the 25, all but eight were within a five-block radius of our neighborhood. Now check this out, he said, as he added a clear film sheet. These are the missing kids. Of the eight that have gone missing, all but two were within a two-block radius of our street. One of them was even on your street, Crystal said, pointing to the dot that sat right over the old Shelby place. Nikki sucked in a breath, and George pretended to clean a smudge on his glasses. Only Dakota looked at the spot, other than Crystal. The three of them knew exactly who that green dot was, and they knew right where he'd gone missing, too. Did... did you know him? Crystal asked. The silence was palpable, and it was Dakota that broke it to the deep surprise of his friends. Yeah, yeah, we did. His name was Chris, and we actually sat in this garage and planned how we were going to get into that old house. Suddenly, Dakota didn't want to be here anymore. It was all too much, all of a sudden, and he wanted to be anywhere but here. He hadn't been in this garage since Chris was taken, but it was like he could see him now as he sat on the moth-eaten old sofa. Over there was where they'd built their Pinewood Derby car. Over there was where they drank soda and watched Mr. McCormick work on his hot rod. In fact... This had been the spot where George had suggested they try to find some of the lost pets to make a little money for something they all wanted to buy. Chris had been sitting right where Crystal was when he suggested that maybe they check out the old house, that maybe some of the missing pets might have gone there. Dakota was on his feet before his brain had caught up with him, and now everyone was staring at him. I, I need to go. I remembered something I need to do. Cody, Crystal asked, but he walked out then. Not sure why in his 12-year-old mind, but knowing that he needed to be anywhere but here.
Everyone was quiet that evening at dinner. His sister was looking into her mashed potatoes harder than she strictly needed to, and it was so she could avoid looking at her mother or stepfather. Her stepfather had caught her leaving school early, and her mother had thrown a fit about it. It wouldn't have been so bad, but he had caught her skipping school at Harris Pond, in the back of a boy's car, as the two of them tried their best to press their faces into each other. His stepdad thought it was hilarious, at least until he got home and shared it with his wife. Dakota's mother had not thought it was hilarious, and his mother and sister had been fighting for most of the afternoon. Now, they were all trying very hard not to look at each other, and it made Dakota realize how silly he was being. He was basically doing the same thing to Crystal, whether he wanted to admit it or not. She didn't understand why what she was asking hurt him. She didn't know about the little ghost that filled the vacant hole in their group, but if she meant to stay, then it might be time to tell her. He felt stupid for his actions earlier, and he made a mental note to apologize tomorrow before things had time to fester. When the doorbell rang, Dakota was glad for a distraction that would take him away from the table. The tension was thicker than the meatloaf his mother had served them. He was expecting that it might be Nikki trying to see what all that had been about, but he was surprised to find Crystal standing on his front porch. She nervously tucked a hair behind her ear, looking a little embarrassed to be found out here, but resolute in her reason for coming. I'm sorry, she said, her words squeezed from her when she found nothing else to say. I didn't mean to push or anything. I should have figured it was a touchy subject and left it alone. I'm sorry if you don't want to. N no, Dakota said. No, it's, it's okay. He went to sit on the porch swing as he let the door close, not sure where to begin, but when she came to join him, he decided on the beginning. Did they tell you about what happened after I left? He knew they wouldn't have, but he still wanted to ask. No, they, they made it out like it was a big secret, something they didn't feel was right for them to tell. Dakota nodded. Well, when we were eight, George suggested that we go look for some of the missing pets that we kept seeing posters for. His dad's an outdoorsman, t total opposite of George, and he had some of those no-harm traps that we could use for cats and stuff, stuff he didn't want to kill, you know? George thought we could track the animals to their last location and lure them out with food so that we could trap them and get the reward money. He'd seen his dad do it to strays before and said there was no reason why house pets wouldn't fall for it. We were setting a trap near the Shelby place, figuring it would be the perfect spot for strays and lost pets to go hide when we heard a noise. It was like a hurt cat or a dog, something from down under the house. And we ran, thinking it was a ghost or something, I guess. When we got back to Chris's garage, he said it was probably one of the lost pets, and we should go back and try to help it. We were all terrified of the old house, except for Chris, and when he suggested we go inside, we all tried to talk him out of it. Finally, he said he was going in there, with or without us. So, we went too. He glanced at her to make sure that he wasn't boring her, but he found that she was hanging on his words. With the sun setting behind her, it seemed to spark a light in her golden hair, and Dakota felt his cheeks warm up a little as he looked away. He could see why Nikki was trying so hard. She was quite lovely. So, we went in. It wasn't hard. The front door was unlocked, and there was no wood across it then. The house was bad. There were water stains on the walls, the carpets crunched underfoot, the windows were mostly boarded up, so it was pretty dark. We had our flashlights, so we made our way through the living room and into the kitchen. It was the worst room of the bunch. The whole place seemed to glow green. The tiles were black and white, but the white seemed to be lime as it reflected the walls. The walls were thick forest green, and the sink dripped constantly. I remember a spindly table with a single chair at it. And when we walked in, the basement door suddenly came open. It creaked like a fun house, and we were all scared out of our mind. But then a single mew came from down the stairs, and that was all it took for Chris. He was going down there. And when we told him it was all too much, he turned and told us not to be scaredy-cats. He turned 
looking her dead in the eyes as she waited for the final blow. That's when... That's when something grabbed him and pulled him down the stairs. The door slammed shut and we all ran like cowards. We went to Chris's house and his mom called the police. His dad was away at some rally for his racing team, or he'd have probably gone down there himself. The cops came, but they didn't find anything, and Chris became the first kid to get snatched. They didn't really believe us at first, but when another kid went missing a month later, they started taking us a little more seriously. That's why we hate that house. It took our friend, and it never gave him back. That's why it's hard to be in your house. That's why it... She stopped him when she hugged him, and he leaned against her as her warmth enveloped him. When they separated, she looked a little flushed herself. I'm sorry about your friend, she whispered. If you don't want to help us, I I understand, but it's something I feel like I've got to do. But why? Dakota asked. You're new here. You don't even know anybody that got snatched. I've... I've got my reasons, she said, but I'd like to see justice for your friend, too. When Dakota looked at her, he thought he saw her earnestness coming through with the setting sun, and nodded. How can I say no in that case? She smiled. Why don't we meet here tomorrow then? Might be easier. George has a theory he wants to bounce off you guys, and it might lead to a little excitement, she said, her eyes becoming mischievous. Sounds fun, but you should get home. My dad's a cop, and, well, the curfew and all. She nodded, getting up from the swing before stopping halfway to the stairs. Thanks for being honest with me, Cody. I'm glad you told me. It just makes me want to catch this guy even more. She ran off then, saying she would see him tomorrow, and Dakota sat on the porch and watched her until she was safely behind her door. He sat on his porch for a while after that, letting the darkness gather on the street before his mom called him and told him to come inside seemed so unreal that on a night like this, someone might get taken on a quiet street like his. But as he went inside, he caught a glimpse of the rotting hulk that was the old Shelby place, and reminded himself that danger was closer than he thought. It was hard to disbelieve anything when you had a haunted house at the end of your street. Dakota was sitting in front of the TV watching Tom and his continuous pursuit of Jerry when the news report broke in. They'd been hunting for clues for the last week and coming up with nothing. Now it looked like someone else had gone missing. The police are looking for Avery Spotney, who went missing just after sunset yesterday evening. The Spotney twins were returning from a friend's house in Tartown when they cut through the field outside of Ramsey's court. The twins were returning to their home when Avery suddenly fell off his bike and went missing. His brother, Trevin Spotney, claimed that he looked for his brother in the tall grass of the field, but was unable to find him. He did report a strange scuffling sound coming from the grass and left to get his mother. The young boy appeared suddenly, looking scared and unsure of himself. He fell into the hay and something grabbed him. I tried to help, but he was in too deep, so I went to get my dad and we never found him. It switched back to the news anchor then the woman talking to someone off screen before straightening up. Our prayers are with the family of Avery Spotney tonight. Anyone with information on his whereabouts or with information on the case is asked to call the Culver Police Department. The show came back on then, but Dakota wasn't in the mood for cartoons anymore. No more than he was interested in the Lucky Charms getting soggy in his bowl. He heard the phone ring and already knew who it was from. His mom was out back hanging laundry, his stepdad was at work, and His sister was out with her friends. He had just been thinking about going to see Nikki, but he suspected that this call would fix that. Cooper residence. Did you see the news? Crystal asked, her voice strained. Dakota felt his cheeks warm up a little. He had been expecting it to be George, honestly. Yeah, um, I hate it for them. The Spotney twins were good baseball players. Coach Tate's gonna have to scramble next year to get a good second baseman. There was silence for a minute and Dakota wondered if he had lost her. How do you do that? she asked, her voice sounding sad and tired. Do what? You, Nikki, everyone converts tragedy into inconvenience. I don't understand it. It must be hereditary. Dakota had never really thought about it, but 
He had to admit it was true. They'd spent the last week pounding the pavement and looking for clues, but everywhere they went, they got the same response. Madeline's den mother said that it sure was a shame that she was gone because she'd been looking forward to the jamboree coming up. Her friend Krista was sad that now she'd never be able to get her baking badge. Jasper's friends said they hated that he'd disappeared because he'd been looking forward to a metal show next month. Crystal had ridden home with them, lost in thought, and when Dakota had asked her about it, she'd shaken her head. No, no one's ever sad in this town, she said, likely hoping it was too low for anyone to hear. It's just a thing we do out here, Dakota said, incapable of explaining it better than that. Anyway, Crystal said, George is already here and Nicky's on his way. Come over so we can strategize. Okay, Dakota said, and as he hung up the phone, he jumped when music suddenly flared through the static of the radio. I wouldn't if I were you. No telling what she'll do. The woman is wild. She could really tear your life apart. He reached over and turned the radio off. It seemed like he was haunted by that song lately, and... If he believed in signs, he might have taken it as a bad one. What was it that was going to eat him up? Was it whatever was taking Culliver's children, or was it this mysterious girl that adopted his little friend group? Either way, Dakota knew that he'd let them in the end. His summer would be boring otherwise. Jesus! I doubt we could have chosen a hotter day for this. Crystal shaded her eyes as she looked at Nikki. Nick, you would have never made it in San Diego. This is considered a nice day on the West Coast. After some RC colas and an hour of argument, they had decided to go to the field where Avery had gone missing. Well, decided was a strong word. George and Crystal had finally talked Dakota into it, and Nicky had come along since he had nothing better to do in the end. The grass field behind the neighborhood was huge, and most people thought it would be the next victim of Culver's expanding neighborhood project. Not quick enough to save Avery Spotney from the snatcher, but his disappearance would probably be the straw that broke the camel's back. Inside of three years, the grass field would be an empty lot, and just as the kids were leaving for college, there would be new families moving into the brand new houses as the ever-expanding borders of Culver continued to bulge. They could cut the grass, till the earth, sift through every grain of sand, but as Dakota stood at the edge of the grass sea, he suddenly was very sure that they would never find Avery's body. The poor kid wasn't here to be found, and they were just looking for his discarded memories. What are we looking for exactly? Dakota asked. The police took his bike when they found it, as well as the sleeveless t-shirt he'd been wearing that they also found in the field. Crystal pulled her hat down low, her sunglasses making her look like an archaeologist as she waded heedlessly into the grass. Anything. We're here to see what they might have missed. Dakota moved up beside her as she stepped into the grass, taking a stick he had found as he pushed it aside. As if on cue, a large snake slithered out of their way, its markings making Dakota think it was the kind that you didn't want to mess with if you could help it. I don't know how it is in California, but around here, you have to check for snakes before you go blundering off into the tall grass. Crystal had seen the snake and nodded as she started off again. George had a walking stick from his last scouting trip outing, but Nicky had an honest-to-God machete with him. They all let him go first as he went hacking through the tall grass like Indiana Jones, scattering the wildlife as he crashed through. George and Dakota were careful to keep the tall grass at bay as Nicky hacked away, and when they came to the police tape, they saw that they weren't the only ones who had been cutting back grass. The tape marked off a muddy track about 12 by 15 feet, and it mostly marked a series of skid marks. Someone had hit a muddy patch and ate it hard. The bike had skidded and the rider had slid through the mud as well. The indentions where he had come to rest were clear enough, but there was something else there too. It was a long drag mark. A long, thick line in the mud that stretched back into the grass. It wasn't deep enough to be a tire track, but it was too wide to be a drag mark, from Avery at least, and the police couldn't seem to decide what it was either. Maybe it's a wheelbarrow track, George said, all of them careful to stay beyond the police tape. I can't imagine anyone driving a wheelbarrow through here, Nick said, 
I guess it's possible, but I don't even really like to ride my bike through here. The wildlife is too numerous, especially at sunset. Do kids ride through here a lot? Crystal asked. Only if they're in a hurry. Most kids play on the edge of the grass. Kids get snake bit out here sometimes and tends to make the rest of us think twice about playing in the deep grass. Crystal looked down at her feet as if expecting to see something slithering between her sneakers. I can't imagine why anyone would need a wheelbarrow out here, Nikki said again, looking at the indentations as they disappeared back into the grass. Unless they needed to transport something. Like a body, Crystal said. George looked at Dakota, which means it could be somebody close by. Or it could just be a weird drag mark, Nikki said. Heck, it's heading deeper into the grass. If it was going into town, I could understand that, but it's going towards the new highway more than anything. It's the only real clue we have, Dakota said, as if that meant anything. Nikki threw his hands up in exasperation. Jumping Jesus on a pogo stick. Don't tell me you're enjoying yourself out here. It's hotter than Satan's right toe, and I'm tired of playing detective when we could be doing anything else. Nikki had been getting fed up with the investigation lately, reminding them that they had said they would pack it in after a week if they hadn't found anything. George, however, was saying that they had learned some things and they were bringing solid evidence to the table. He had narrowed down the Snatcher's hunting ground and he thought he might be able to catch him with some luck. What was more, Nikki had noticed the glances between Crystal and Dakota, and when it seemed obvious that she wasn't going to throw herself at him, he'd kind of lost interest in the case. Without much to do, though, since his friends were involved in this makeshift Scooby-Doo club, he came along so as not to have to spend time by himself. Nikki, at his core, was someone who hated spending time alone more than he hated being uncomfortable. Just what the hell are you kids doing out here? came a sudden cry, and all four of them jumped as an officer made his careful way towards them. Dakota gritted his teeth, expecting a butt chewing, as that voice was one he knew very well. His stepdad came up on the other side of the tape, the groups looking at each other like armies across a battlefield. Nothing, Dad, Dakota said, George looking down as if guilty of something. This is a crime scene, in case you didn't know, Officer Carter said, his face letting them know that he wasn't mad, just unsure why they were here. Dakota's stepdad never really got angry, at least not that he'd ever seen. He was a patient guy, probably didn't possess the mentality they were looking for in a peace officer, and he was more interested in helping than anything. He was a good guy, and Dakota was usually pretty happy to have him around the house. We know, Dakota said, hedging as he tried to come up with a good excuse. We were just, um, looking at the scene. We saw it on the news and just wanted to see it. Officer Carter's face looked at odds with itself as he tried to decide what to do. Well, you've had your look, right? You haven't gone in and moved anything, have you? No, Dad, of course not. We know better than that. Then head on, kids. This place isn't safe. The kids nodded, saying quiet sorries as they took their leave. Co Dakota, can I have ordered? He asked. Dakota stopped, nodding as he told his friends he'd catch up with them. He moved around the tape, trying not to break the scene, and his stepdad did his best to meet him halfway. Let me give you a ride, he said, hooking a thumb at his cruiser at the edge of the field. I, I rode my bike. I can fit it in my back seat. I, I just want to talk for a minute. Dakota nodded, already figuring he knew what this one was going to be about. They made their ponderous way through the grass field, and Dakota stopped more than once as something big moved through the grass. His stepdad's boots were a little better equipped for this kind of thing than his high tops, and even he froze to watch his step a time or two. It always made Dakota laugh to watch the man work. He was a big guy, probably six foot three, with a barrel chest and arms of corded muscle from farm work when he was young. Despite his size, he always moved like he was afraid that he might hurt someone by existing. He talked soft, showed a lot of patience, and his appearance usually ensured that even the most ornery drunk didn't step to Officer Carter. Dakota climbed into the front seat as his stepdad manhandled his bike into the back seat. As they set off, he watched the grass wave a farewell to its most recent guests. I hear you and your friends have been asking a lot of questions around town, he said, turning the wheel as they went back towards the neighborhood. We, we were just asking questions, Dakota said, and I appreciate you wanting to help, but it's dangerous right now for even a group of kids to be wandering around. 
Dakota looked out the window, not answering, but just waiting for the ride to be over. Officer Carter, it seemed, wasn't done, though. I just... I just want to make sure you guys are safe. It would kill your mother if anything happened to you or your sister. It'd probably kill me, too. Just don't... Just don't do anything too brash, okay? I'm not in a hurry to put your name on one of these reports. They pulled into the cul-de-sac then, and Dakota got out as he took his bike out of the back of the cruiser. Just be careful, okay? Stepdad added. See you at dinner, buddy. See you then, Dad, Dakota said, watching him go as he realized he had likely just lied to his old man. You are out of your mind, Nikki said as Dakota came into the garage. Keep your voice down, Crystal said. I'm just saying it would be the best way to get information. It's not allowed, George said. We'd be picked up. Not if we were careful. If we go waving our flashlights around and attracting attention to ourselves, then yeah, of course we'd get spotted. But if we're smart about it, we can go and stake out the area and see who's getting these kids. What are you guys talking about? Dakota asked, having a nasty suspicion that he knew just what they were talking about. Crystal wants to go out after curfew, Nikki said. Absolutely not, Dakota said right away. My stepdad would have a bird, and my mom would have a whole flock. Crystal rolled her eyes. I swear, how sheltered are you guys? Have you never snuck out before? All three of them shook their heads in unison. Even before the curfew, they had never really been out when they weren't supposed to. Culver had a weird set of rules that were unspoken, but inherently known and very few kids out of high school went out after dark. Dakota didn't even really like to take the trash out once the sun set. It always felt like something might be lurking around, just waiting for you to let your guard down. Look, Dakota tells his parents he's staying at Nikki's house. Nikki tells his parents he's staying at George's house. George tells his parents he's staying at Dakota's house. And then we all go out and see what we can see. You all come stay in my garage when we're done and no one's the wiser. Stay here? Dakota asked. Yeah, why? Is that a problem? Crystal asked. No way my mom would let me stay at a girl's house, Nikki said. Mine either, said George. That's why you don't tell them, dummy, Crystal said. Look, trust me, we'll go out, get some recon, maybe get some real clues as to who's been doing all this. Don't you want to solve this? Don't you want to feel like you're doing something? Don't you want to get this curfew lifted? They all looked at each other, but what she said next made the hair stand up on the back of Dakota's neck. Come on, what are you guys, chicken? It was an eerie mimic of Chris's last words. Fine, Dakota said. Sure, George said. Why not, said Nikki. I'm sure there's room in the van for all of us. Crystal smiled. Ha ha, but with any luck, we'll find nothing more serious than a creep trolling around for some prey. By this time next week, we could be living without the threat of some weirdo hanging over the town. They separated then, all agreeing to ask their parents about staying at each other's houses this Friday, about two days from now. Dakota knew his parents would say yes. Nikki probably wouldn't even have to really ask, but it was still risky. Going out after dark, they'd get arrested. They'd get drug home like convicts, and that's if they were lucky. If they were very unlucky, they might just get to meet the Snatcher who haunted the streets of Culver. For the record, Nikki said, his normally high voice pitched low, this is a terrible idea. The four had hit the street just after the street lights came on, and as they rode, all of them kept their eyes peeled for blue and white lights. Dakota had pulled a hooded sweatshirt out of his closet, and Nikki had thought similar. His was green, but at least it was dark green. George, on the other hand, was in a denim jacket with slacks, for some reason. He was going to stand out like a sore thumb when the lights hit him, and it was communally agreed that if anyone was spotted, they would scatter. Crystal had gone for jeans and a gray t-shirt, and as Dakota sweated in his hoodie, he wished he'd gone the same route. Her blonde hair was in a tail and pulled under her cap, and they were traveling by streetlights alone. Noted, Crystal hissed, but she didn't slow in the least bit. So what's the plan? Dakota whispered, his face shadowed as they moved between the lights. Ride around, look for suspicious vehicles, see what we can see. That's it? 
he said incredulously. Terrible idea, Nikki said again. Well, I don't see any of you guys coming up with better ones, she blurted out. All the snatchings happen after sunset, so between 8 and 10 seems to be our best time to go searching. She and George had formulated that plan earlier, Nikki and Dakota interjecting tidbits here and there. In all the snatchings, the kids have been taken after sunset, George had said, showing them instances with potential times. No one ever goes missing during the daytime, at least not that we can tell, and the disappearances peter off after summer, usually starting in the spring again. Crystal nodded, tapping the map of the five closest neighborhoods. The map was overlaid with the plastic cover for the pet disappearances and the abductions of the children. Once you put it together like that, it was hard to argue that the five blocks around the residential area weren't the kidnapper's usual stomping ground. That tells me that the Snatcher is taking advantages of times when the kids will be out past dark, or when they're likely to be alone. If we go carefully around just after sunset, then maybe we can see someone cruising for kids, or at least spot something the police have missed. That was how they'd come to be in the park around 3 o'clock, eating a picnic lunch and watching the traffic. It was right beside the library, and the playground there was one that the boys had played on often when they were younger. Heck, they had been playing on it the day before Chris had gotten snatched, and they couldn't help but watch the tykes that played there now. Any one of them could be taken tonight. Any one of them could be the next victim of the snatcher. What if, what if it's not a person? Nikki put in, turning Dakota away from the kids who had been squabbling over some game of tag. What do you mean? George said. Of course it's a person. Kids don't just disappear out of nowhere. Not kids barely even in middle school. Nikki had been trying to be helpful lately, clearly noticing that they weren't just going to let this drop. He wasn't enjoying the game. But Nikki realized that, unless he wanted to sit at home by himself, then he was part of this too. They all were, for better or worse, and this case had kind of consumed their lives for the past week and a half. Yeah, but what if, what if it's a spirit or something? We haven't explored that. I mean, we're looking for a guy in a van or something. What if... He leaned down to whisper the next part like he didn't dare say it out loud. What if it's the ghost of Harold Shelby? Dakota rolled his eyes. Oh, come off it. You know they say he roams the neighborhood at night, Nicky said, raising his hands defensively. That's just schoolyard talk, George said. They all knew that George had the same opinion of ghosts as Ebenezer Scrooge and considered that they were more gravy or wishful thinking than grave about them. You mean the guy who used to own the Shelby place? Crystal asked. Yeah, Nicky said. My dad told me that when he was a kid... The Shelby still lived there. There was Harold, his wife, and his son, Harold Jr. They say that Shelby Sr. was into some weird stuff. He was a kind of zoologist or something. Liked to study different snakes and reptiles and things. A uh, herpetologist, George put in. No, like a snake researcher. I didn't say anything about herpes. No, I mean... Oh, forget it. Anyway, Dad said that Shelby Sr. hated kids didn't even much care for his own son, and he was constantly running them off the sidewalk in front of his house or yelling at kids who came up to sell stuff. Dad was actually friends with his son, Harold Jr., and he said he went in there a few times to see him. Dad told me that there were all kinds of snakes and species of reptiles in the house, especially in the basement. His old man used to, like, breed different specimens or something, and Dad said he had a bunch of them. He only got to look around a few times, because when Harold Sr. caught them in the basement one day, he told my dad he'd better never catch him in the house again. Harold Jr. came to school the next day with bruises, and Dad said it was pretty common knowledge that he beat his wife, too. That's awful and all, but I still don't see how that has anything to do with ghosts, Dakota said. I'm getting to that. Well, when his wife finally got the strength to leave him, she took Harold Jr. and divorced him moving away to live with her parents a couple of towns over. They say after that, Shelby became a real butt, yelling at kids and running them off on the golf club. They said he beat some girl and put her in the hospital, but he had enough money to pay his way out of it. Dad told me that when he was in high school, some of the kids broke some of his downstairs windows, said he maybe threw a rock or two himself, and the boards had been put up since then. When Shelby died not long after beating that girl up, it wasn't much of a surprise to anyone. 
Some say her father did it. Some say it was her brother's. Some say one of his snakes just didn't like how he was being handled. But the whole neighborhood breathed a sigh of relief without crazy Harold Shelby roaming around. The state came in and took all of his snakes for research purposes, but I heard he had some real freaks in there. People say they covered some of them with tarps, but they were huge, and some of them were pretty mean. So, George said, we all know Shelby was a real piece of work. So, Nikki said, so why wouldn't he come back as a ghost? Shelby didn't like anybody, his own family included. It's not a stretch that he'd feel like his life's work was unfinished. He'd be a vengeful old spook who lures kids in and makes them pay for, I don't know, tr trespassing or just existing or something. Good theory, George said, but you forgot that the disappearances didn't start till about five years after Shelby died. What was he doing for all that time? Catching up on his correspondences? Nikki shrugged. I don't know, it was, it was just a thought. George and Nikki went back and forth about ghosts a little more, Crystal just shaking her head at them as Dakota scanned the vehicles around the park. It could be any one of them. Any one of those vehicles could hold whoever they were looking for. What about you? Any other theories on who the Snatcher is? Crystal asked. It would honestly be easier if it was just a ghost, Dakota said, watching a white panel van as it pulled over to ask a mother and her daughter something. If it was a ghost, then you could just sprinkle holy water on it or say some Hail Marys and make it go away. More like it's some guy who likes to hurt kids, and that's scarier than any ghost. People are harder to get rid of with some words and a dowsing of water. They cleaned up not long after and started aimlessly riding their bikes around Culver. They were still riding as the sun sank beneath the trees and the insects began to tune up. Okay, Crystal said. Now we can start. It's been an hour, Nikki said at nine o'clock. How much longer are we going to do this? Just, just a little longer, Crystal said, moving her head about fretfully. We need a plan, Dakota began, but then hissed as he saw the front of a white car at the end of the block. Hide, he growled, thinking it might be a cop car. They swerved into a ditch, their shoes now full of muddy water, as the car pulled lazily into view, turning out to be someone's hatchback. As it left, they all sighed in relief and started rolling again. Come on, Nikki said, slapping at a mosquito. If we were going to find something, we'd have found it already. Let's head back. Not, not yet. Just a little longer, Crystal said. I... But as they passed Piney Road, the chuff of her brakes made them stop. There was a dark-colored car parked in front of one of the houses, and somebody was in it. The lights were off, but the engine was still purring away. Through the fisheye window on the back, you could see the hazy shadows of two people moving in the back of the car. It was hard to tell from here, but they looked like they might be tussling, the car shaking ever so slightly now and again with their efforts. Let's get a closer look, Crystal breathed, and the four of them came quickly towards the car. The closer they got, the more they could see the smeary back window, and the less they liked it. Was this the snatcher they had been looking for? as he took another kid. What are we gonna do if it turns out to be our guy? Dakota asked. Put our lights on him, I guess. Startle him, get a good look at him. Maybe give whoever he has time to get away. Get ourselves grabbed too, Nikki hissed. There's five of us, including whoever's in that car, Crystal put in. I think we can hold off one adult long enough for some of us to get away and call the cops. I'll get his license plate number, just in case he speeds off, George said and they all nodded, thinking that was a pretty good idea. They laid their bikes on the sidewalk and approached on foot. They could get them easily if they needed to, and as George bent down to write the license plate, the other three snuck up to the back door. The car was definitely jouncing some, and as they moved into position, Dakota thought he heard that song again. Hall and Oates were once again trying to warn him off something, but he would began to hope that maybe it was a sign Perhaps the duo was trying to lead them on to something, and he hoped it wasn't too dangerous. As he pulled the door open and shone their light into the car, Dakota turned his head as a song blasted out onto the street. What it had led them to was something different. What the hell, kid? yelled a guy who was only about four years older than him tops and had no business calling anyone kid. He and the girl in the back seat looked like deer trapped in headlights, 
and they had startled them in the middle of something that was far from a kidnapping. The boy was naked to the waist. The girl's top opened to reveal her white bra. They could see now why the windows had been so smeary. And as he slammed the door shut, all three of them beat a hasty retreat before the boy could give chase. They had grabbed their bikes and were preparing to scat just as a different light hit them. And when the blue and whites flipped on, they mounted their bikes and beat a hasty retreat. 45 minutes later, and after a lot of rioting and huffing and cutting through people's backyards and side yards, the four of them sat at the edge of the grass lot and caught their breath. It was a quarter till ten, and when Nikki suggested they pack it in, it was decided in favor of. Decided on, but not unanimously agreed to. Come on, guys, Crystal huffed, out of breath but not deterred. Just, just a little bit longer. Nikki slapped a bug off his cheek, not for the first time that night and George was a panting mess as the underarms of his jacket bled darkly with sweat. Nicky looked at Crystal as if he had something he really wanted to say, but Dakota rode over the start of his sarcastic response. If we were going to see something, we'd have seen it by now. No one's been grabbed this late, at least not that we're aware of. At this point, we're just tempting fate. Crystal couldn't argue with that, and as the four turned for home, they were forced to call the night a bust. Now they were heading home with nothing to show for their efforts but sore legs and sweaty clothes. I told you this was a bad idea, Nikki complained as they pedaled for home. It was an idea, Dakota said. Whether it was bad or not is up for debate. If you wanted a slumber party, he said turning to Crystal, you could have just said so. We could have been in your garage playing Super Nintendo this whole time, taking turns on Mario Bros or something. We didn't have to come all the way out here just to hang out. Crystal looked away, and as she passed beneath the streetlights, Dakota could see her eyes were a little shiny. Lay off, Nick. She thought that what she was doing would help. They were turning down their own block now, but Nicky was far from done. Yeah, I know, said Nicky, his usual good humor running short. That's what we all thought we were doing out here, but we've done nothing but scare the crap out of a couple of high school kids that'll probably want to kick our butts the next time they see us. All we've been doing for the last couple of weeks is sticking our noses where they don't belong. After tonight, can we maybe get back to doing some normal things? Because I'm a little tired of... Whatever it was that Nikki was tired of, they would never know. He came up abruptly short as the front tire of his bike hit something, and he went flying over his handlebars, skipping across the pavement like a hockey puck. The others skidded to a halt, Nikki already moaning and gripping his leg, but whatever he had hit, they had missed. He'd been at the extreme right of their formation, and as they went to help him, they heard a harsh rasp of something as it slid across the asphalt. George had gone down to help Nicky, trying to see how bad it was, and Dakota was halfway to his side when he heard Crystal make a strange noise. It was like a scream pushed through a wet hose, and he turned around as her hand slipped shakily into his. He saw it behind them, its body rising as it spat out a harsh sound like an angry wasp. It was huge, its body rising nearly nine to ten feet into the air, and it had a dark hood around its head that opened like a sail. Dakota wanted to reach for his flashlight, wanted to see what this shadowy creature was, but he was frozen under the gaze of those piss-yellow eyes. Nicky was gibbering now, and Dakota thought it had nothing to do with his leg. George was still fussing over him, trying to figure out what was injured, but when Nicky turned his head, he suddenly saw what had grabbed their attention and loosed a loud scream to the night. Whatever it was, it left them then, heading towards the shadowy hulk that lay beyond one of the few street lamps that didn't work, straight towards the old Shelby place. What? Nicky began, gulping as he tried to bring moisture back to his mouth. What in the hell was that? I don't, I don't know, Dakota whispered, but as the lights from a nearby living room caught his eye when they winked to life, he realized they had to get out of the road. Come on, he said, helping George lift Nicky as he pulled him towards Crystal's house. The garage door opened smoothly, and as they sat him on the ratty sofa, George sucked in a harsh breath. Nicky's toes were facing his other foot. His ankle's broken, George whispered, 
as Nikki sucked in a painful little breath now that he was stationary. I don't know why you're bothering to whisper, Nikki panted. My ears work just fine. We need to get him to a hospital, George said. And Dakota nodded, realizing this was all going to end very badly. They'd have to explain why they'd been riding bikes at nearly 11 o'clock at night in the first place, and all four of them were likely going to be grounded until school started. As Nikki put the back of his hand to his mouth to stop from sobbing, however, Dakota realized that his friend was worth the trouble, and they couldn't leave him like this. Okay. Crystal, where's your... But when Dakota turned, he realized that Crystal wasn't with them. Looking back to the street, all he saw was the pile of bikes they had left in the road as well. He started to panic for a half second, but then he looked to the shapeless mass two houses down and knew where he would find her. She was more like Chris than any of them could have known, and she had chased her answers all the way to the last place he wanted to go. She's gone to the Shelby place. George looked at Dakota like he didn't understand what he was saying. Crystal went to the Shelby place, he said again, and this time it seemed to sink in. With, with that thing there? What the hell would she do that for? I don't know, Dakota said, his writhing guts at odds with what he knew he had to do. I don't know, but someone, someone needs to go after her. I need you to stay here with Nikki. Like heck, George said. I'm not going to leave you alone to face that thing. With any luck, I won't have to. I'm hoping she hasn't made it inside yet. If I can stop her and talk some sense into her, then maybe I can... What the hell are you kids doing in my garage? George and Dakota turned to find an angry man with a baseball bat, leaning out the inner door to the garage. The thick old pine instrument seemed ready to do mayhem, and the front of his robe had come open, displaying his jockey shorts and a chest that was still tanned from the California sun. He wore glasses, his hair short but blonde like his daughter's, and Dakota realized that this was the first time he had met Crystal's father. He hoped it wouldn't be the last. I'm sorry, sir. I, I know this must be a terrible shock right now, but my friend needs help. We were looking for something with your daughter, but now she's in trouble. I need to go stop her before she hurts herself, but my friend here needs an ambulance. His foot's really hurt, and he... The sound of the bat clattering to the concrete stopped Dakota, and when the man sighed, it took him by surprise. Does this have anything to do with the Snatcher case? Dakota started to nod, but shook his head instead. He honestly wasn't sure. Has my daughter been abducted? He shook his head with a little more certainty this time. Good. Go bring her back, and I'll call an ambulance for your friend. It's, it's honestly not the first time she's done something like this, and it's usually one of her friends who goes and gets her to come home. Dakota nodded, still not sure what to say to that, but as the man went back inside, presumably to call someone, Dakota took off for the Shelby place. He didn't have anything except his flashlight, but he hoped he wouldn't need anything else. If luck was with him, she wouldn't have been able to make it through the front door. If there was a god above who watched over children like him, then she'd be crying on the porch or fruitlessly trying to pull the boards off when he arrived. He pulled out his flashlight as he got to the edge of the weed-choked yard and began searching. Beneath the pale weeds, Dakota was surprised to see more of the tracks they had found in the field. More than one, actually. Some of them crisscrossed each other, and they seemed to be heading in all directions. Most of them ended under the porch, but many more wound around the back. He couldn't believe they had never seen or questioned these, but he supposed that they'd never really been looking. The beam of his flashlight wound up the porch steps, and when he saw the wood crisscrossing the door, he felt a rush of relief rising in him. When the wind pushed against the door and banged it against the far wall, that relief fizzled like a spark in a rainstorm. He was going to have to go into this place, whether he wanted to or not, and he very much did not. I wouldn't if I were you, he whispered, his skin crawling as he heard himself whispering the lyrics like an incantation. I know what she can do. He ducked between two of the boards and let his flashlight illuminate the entryway of the sagging old relic that had haunted his dreams. She's deadly, man. She could really rip your world apart. He ducked between two of the boards 
again not sure who he was singing about, as he let his flashlight illuminate the entryway to the sagging old relic that had haunted his dreams. In his nightmares, they explored for hours, the halls stretching on and on as they went through rooms that had never existed on their way to the inevitable climax. In reality, the trip was much less grand. Dakota went left and passed into a living room with a sagging leather couch and a dusty coffee table. There was a TV across from the couch, and in his dreams it always lit the room with a hazy wash of static. It was dark now, the glass eye covered in thick dust. There was a broken tank in one corner, and another not too far away, their front smashed as if something had crashed its way out. The floor crunched beneath his feet, and he was glad he'd worn his sneakers instead of his high tops. He looked down at the broken glass that still covered the dusty boards and wondered why Harold Shelby had never bothered to clean it up after the kids broke the windows. He had thought enough to put the wood up, but the glass had been something he never cared to clean. Maybe it was from the tanks. Dakota didn't know. But he supposed that maybe that late in life, Harold Shelby had other priorities, or just didn't care. He really had no clue either way. As he turned his light towards the servant hallway, the dust motes danced around him like the first magical snow of the season. It was a short stretch between the living room and the kitchen. The hallway had four doors along it, two on either side, and George had been afraid that something would pop out at them like a funhouse attraction. Dakota remembered the smaller boy clinging to him as they went, and he almost felt he could hear someone crying the closer he got. The four of them had been afraid, other than Chris, but they had gone regardless. Regardless of the squirming dread that now lived within him, Dakota went as well, and was unsurprised to find that the crying was not his imagination. Crystal stood with her hands against the closed door, sobbing and shaking as the green of that hoarded place glared around her. It was just the same as it had been in his nightmare, and time had done nothing to change the fear it instilled in him. The walls were still that deep forest green. The floor, the strange white and black tiles picking up the green and making the whole room glow. The knife was still buried in the cutting board. The sink was still dripping eternally. But the table now lay on its side. One of the legs had given way and it had taken the chair with it when it fell. He took it all in with a single glance before going to Crystal and trying to comfort her. Thank God. We need to get out of here, he whispered. It's not safe. Something... It's in the basement, she whispered, snorting in something soupy that made her sound congested. What? Dakota asked, not fully understanding. I followed it. It was injured when Nikki hit it. That's why it... That's why it threatened us. It slid away once it figured out we weren't going to attack it. And I followed it here. It went right down the stairs, but when I got to the door and looked down into the depths of the basement, I couldn't bring myself to go down there. I was frozen. I couldn't move. I just kept thinking how useless I was. The answers I needed are down there, and I can't go find them. The last piece I need before going home is within reach, and I'm too scared to get it. What are you talking about? Dakota asked, not understanding any of it. What peace? What answers? She turned from the door, and he could see that she'd been crying hard. Her eyes were swollen, and there was snot dripping from her nose. She didn't seem as confident as she had all those weeks, and when he reached for her, she let him pull her in close. I lied to you, she whispered into his shoulder. I lied to all of you. I needed to find the snatcher so I could help my dad. I needed him to get done so that we could get out of here, so I could go back to California. Dakota let her lean on him, her sniffling coming in spurts, and he kept his eyes on the door as she told him her dark secret. Dad's a writer, but he's been going through some bad luck. His last two books flopped, and he told me we couldn't afford to live in California anymore. Mom didn't want to come with us when he came here to write a book about the Snatcher. So we so we left her there to stay with some friends. 
he rented the house until he gets the royalties from the book, but it needs an ending. It needs a conclusion. If I can find the Snatcher, then he can write about him being apprehended. Then, then we can go back and Mom will come to live with us again and we can be a family. All that's down in the basement. I, I just know it. I'm, I'm too much of a coward to go down there, though. They stood in silence, the wicked old golem creaking around them as Dakota tried to make it all make sense. So this, this whole time, you've been trying to leave again. I know, I know. At first, I just didn't think I could do it by myself, but, but after a while, I, I really began to think of all of you as friends. It hurt me to use you, but I had no choice. You guys know the area, you know the victims. I knew that if I had any hope of finding whoever was doing this, I needed your help. Dakota looked back at the basement door. And you think they're down there? Well, I, I saw something go down there, and it's where the first victim disappeared from. The first victim, Dakota breathed in. You mean... But he couldn't say it. He wouldn't say it. He would not say his name. Not in this place. Is there another way out of here? He asked. Crystal shook her head. I went around the whole house. There's there's no outside access. This is the only way in or out. Then we need to call the police, he said. What if it leaves while we're gone? Dakota hadn't thought of that. They would look pretty stupid if the police got here and there was nothing down there. They were probably going to be in a lot of trouble either way, but... If they called the police to come on a wild goose chase, the trouble would be even worse. Go outside and see if the ambulance is here yet. Ambulance? She didn't understand. Nikki got hurt in the fall. He's definitely going to the hospital. Go see if they're here. And if they are, then see if they'll call the police. If they won't, have your dad do it. Tell him to come back after he does. I'll make sure that they don't leave. They could kill you, she hissed. Maybe, but if they wanted to kill someone and get away with it, why didn't they just kill us on the street? Why wouldn't they have killed you while you were standing here by yourself? Crystal couldn't refute that. I'll come back, she promised. I'll, I'll come back as quick as I can. She turned to go, but turned around again and leaned in close. Her lips were warm on his mouth, and she pushed away after only a few seconds. It was a few seconds that felt like an eternity, and like no time at all. Don't die, she hissed, but she smiled while she did it. Then she was gone, and Dakota was left in one of his nightmares. He stood staring at the basement door, dreading the thought of it popping open to reveal some slobbering monster or hooded killer. If it did, he would run for his life and hope the police or the paramedics were somewhere close. The guy wouldn't kill him with witnesses. No way he could do that. And the adults would catch him and it would all be over. Maybe his stepdad would see the lights and hear the commotion and come out to see what was going on. He was a cop. He could, he could get the guy. He could get the guy and be a hero and get a promotion at work. And when the door creaked slowly open, it took all of Dakota's fortitude not to piss his pants. He shone his light on that hollow space, but there was nothing there. What had opened that door if there was nothing there? Slowly, his curiosity got the better of him. He took a step forward. The light shook a little as he peeked down the stairs and into the heart of his terror. They were normal enough, just like the stairs down to his own basement. And the space at the bottom was nothing but bare concrete and dust. No, not just concrete. There was something there, too. It was a strange, shadowed mass that stretched back into the darkness, and as he took a step to see it, he cursed his folly the second he heard the ruinous groan of old wood. The stair splintered, the step giving out beneath him, and Dakota plunged into the darkness like a stone into a well. He expected to fall forever, but he grunted as he landed on something wet and squishy. The spot beneath him felt like paper, or maybe blankets, and when he rolled over, he felt something poking into his arm. 
He winced as it poked at him, and when he rolled to the floor, he shone his light on the landing pad and wished he hadn't. For a moment, he didn't understand what he was seeing, and when it started to come together, he wished for ignorance. He landed on a pile of desiccated bodies, husks, mummies, the remains of people who had been squeezed of their nutrients as they passed through some massive digestive tract. No, not just people. They were kids. It wasn't just kids either, though the smaller ones were harder to tell. The bigger bodies, the human remains, still wore clothes and many were frozen with expressions of fear and exquisite terror. As he backed away, he heard something thick sliding over the concrete of the basement and moved his flashlight in time to see a massive spade-shaped head. The light was in danger of falling from his hand. It was a huge snake. It may have once been a python of some kind, one of its parents certainly, but as it hissed, he saw long teeth dripping clear liquid. Its body was like a tree, thick and writhing, and as it came towards him, he thought his earlier estimate of nine feet may have been stupidly low. Its body spooled out behind it, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen feet long, its piss-yellow eyes boring into him like searchlights. It hissed again, its throat full of hate, and the hood unfurled as it rose to menace him. His thoughts raced as he backed away slowly. A snake. A goddamn snake. He had dismissed Nikki's ideas of ghosts, thinking the kids were being taken by your average garden variety pervert. But this, this was beyond anything. This wasn't just a snake. It was an anaconda, a creature from dinosaur times, something out of a Conan comic. And it would have no trouble gobbling him up whole. Had this thing really been taking the kids? Was it really what he'd been looking for? It, it had been on their street the whole time. It could have easily picked any of them off, but had never found the time. He remembered Nikki saying that some of the snakes the people had taken after Henry Shelby's death were nasty. Looked like they'd missed the worst of them. He grunted as he came up short, his back against the shelf, and the pain as small objects fell on his head was second to the writhing, hissing monster before him. It was five feet away, an easy strike, and Dakota felt his hands looking for something on the shelf to save him. It was tensing, preparing to lunge, and he closed his eyes as his hand found something round and rough. Jesus Christ! Someone shouted, and the exclamation was followed by the bellow of a shotgun. The snake twisted back towards the stairs, hissing in anger. Dakota saw ragged skin near its tail, and as it moved, he held up something in his hand and realized what it was. He pulled the end, the flare coming to life, the snake turning back towards him as the shotgun barked again. Get away from me, Dakota yelled, lobbing the flare at the snake as he reached back to see if there were more. The snake hissed as the flare hit it, slithering back against the far wall as it tried to get away from the boy with the burning fire and whoever was up the stairs shooting at it. Dakota found two more flares within easy reach and popped the end on the other as he waved it in front of him. Whatever it was, the snake wasn't stupid. It knew the fire would burn it, and as Dakota tossed this one at it too, he lit the last one as he made for the stairs. His stepdad was at the top, his shotgun pointed down at the basement, and he pulled the barrel up as Dakota yelled not to shoot. Cody? Thank God, boy, are you okay? It, di it didn't bite you, did it? Dakota didn't answer. He started coming up the creaky stairs, tossing the last flare behind him and in the general direction of the snake. As he climbed, he heard it moving after him, the hated fire now out of his hand. Dakota's foot snapped through a board, but he jumped at his crystal and his dad cheered him on. He could feel the hateful eyes behind him and almost shivered under the pressure of the serpent's gaze. When it lunged, however, it crashed into the stairs as its jaw came down on the splintery wood. Dakota wasted no time, and as he came even with the steps he had gone through at the top, he felt something rumble at the depths of the house. His dad pulled him into a hug, and 
The three had just enough time to turn and slam the door before the floor shook and the house groaned. They came out of the kitchen just as the door blew outward and kept running as flames sprang to life behind him. His stepdad kicked the boards aside as they came through the front door, and as they made the lawn, the flames were already devouring the dry wood of the Shelby place. The three of them sat on the front lawn as the cops arrived, watching it burn, hoping the serpent burned with it. The burning of the Shelby place and the mystery of the giant snake were all the news could talk about for the next month. The snake, some kind of hybrid species as far as they could tell from the bones, had been something Harold Shelby had been working on before his death. It had likely hatched after he had died and been missed by the people who had came to take his other subjects. It was assumed that it had been eating rats and bugs until it had grown large enough for bigger prey. Once it got big enough to get out of the house, it had began eating pets, and once it outgrew those, it moved on to tastier game. It had likely been dinning in the house for the last decade, a zoologist said after, and its leavings could have been of great scientific study. Having seen those leavings, Dakota disagreed. Crystal and her father had had a long talk about what had happened, and it didn't appear they'd be returning to California anytime soon. Turned out that her father hadn't left her mother behind. Crystal's mother had run off after his last book had flopped, and he had taken the last of his savings and took a chance on a book that he was writing now. I didn't want you to feel like it was your fault, he told her, but I guess I failed at that, too. His book, as it turned out, was going to have a very different ending than he had expected, and it was likely so sensational that he'd have to brand it as fiction to get anyone to pick it up. I'm thinking of calling it Maneater, he told Dakota when they asked him about it a few weeks later. Don't worry, though. I'll be sure to give each of you a writing credit in it. Given the circumstances, I think I'd rather have some royalties, Nicky said with a chuckle. Nicky had broken his ankle. Had broken it pretty badly, actually. He was in a cast for the rest of the summer, but came back to school something of a local legend. They all did, all things considered, and Crystal started school next year without having to put up with any of the stigma of being the new girl. She became pretty popular, making friends easily, but she still made time for her best friends, especially for her boyfriend. The Shelby place burned to the ground that very night, and the neighborhood let loose a sigh of relief at its passing. Turned out that one of the flares Dakota had thrown rolled under some kind of tank, and it had gone off in spectacular fashion. There was very little left of the man-eater or her victims, but there had been enough teeth to identify nearly all the missing kids. Culver, too, gave a sigh of relief as the dark cloud that had hung over it for years dissipated. The curfew was lifted, and summer was officially back on. Not bad for some fast and loose detective work, eh? Nicky said as he sat in Crystal's garage and drank pop, the sound of Nicky's SNES pinging away in the background. Dakota smiled. He had to agree. It was a summer that no one would forget for a long, long time.